My family, I love you. Welcome to my 2819 family, who I love deeply. I talk to you like this because I love you. To our online family watching in cities around the country and a few pockets around the world right now live across YouTube, or for some of you watching this at another time, we welcome you to Atlanta, Georgia, where we are doing our best with the grace that God has given us to spread this gospel as far as we can get it to as many people as possible. To all the guests in the room, somebody invited you here, welcome to 2819 into the presence of God. And, uh, and to the unbeliever in the room, those who are not yet followers of Jesus, we're just thankful that you're in this room to eavesdrop on the conversations that our pastor is having with his following, his sheep, his sons and daughters, his brothers and sisters. In Christ's name. My family, we are on the backside. Just maybe four more messages as we're closing out a series called Kingdom Gems where we are walking through line by line, verse by verse, the most important sermon the world has ever heard. The Sermon on the Mount. The full-length recording sermon of Jesus that I want to remind you this morning that it's not just a bunch of platitudes and commandments. It is the blueprint for the best life possible. And I want to remind my brothers and sisters in this room as we are narrowing, go, uh, approaching the end of Kingdom Gems, for you to go back and keep reading Matthew 5 through 7, keep reading the Sermon on the Mount, keep leaning into the Sermon on the Mount, keep trying to apply the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount because, listen to me, it is the blueprint for flourishing, it is the blueprint for thriving, it is the blueprint for the best life possible. If human beings, listen, would experience the best life possible, not just financially, in their mind, in their soul, and horizontally, they will lean into the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount that even Gandhi uses principles to reform a nation for a season. It is the way Jesus wants us to live as kingdom citizens. And it is my cry that we will start to take it seriously. You would, you would leave from these gatherings and go home and read. Read the Sermon on the Mount. You can actually read it in 15 minutes. Although we're going to spend some 10, 12 weeks in it, you can read it in 15 minutes. I want to encourage you to lean into the Sermon on the Mount. In this message, for all my note takers, we're going to unpack uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, will be our main text. And for the sake of context, we're going to have to look at the passages that were preached last week, because although these are separate, it is one uniform thought, and so I need to bring you back to the scriptures from last week, which was Matthew 7, 1 through 6. Our main text for this week is going to be Matthew 7, 7 through 12. And we're just going to tag a title to this text for today. Here is, here is the messages. I just want them to prophetically speak to you for my note takers. I'm going to title this talk today, three words, ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Spirit of the living God, I pray for help. I pray, God, that you would minister through me the truths this eternal word to my brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, friends. May you be glorified as your word is preached. In Christ's name I pray. Somebody agree with me and say amen. amen. Would you just put your hands together one more time? I just, I want to just worship.
Thank you, man of God. Uh, family, the longer I live and the more I reflect on my personal life, my past, and my present, this one truth that I have learned is reinforced in me, and it is this truth, that your greatest joy in this life and your greatest pains in this life, they both flow from the same place, your human relationships. That our relationships are the source of our greatest pain and our human relationships are the source of our greatest joys. Juxtapose the blessings that flow from our human relationships is also the drama and the tragedy and the bickering that flows from our human relationships. And I believe that while the greatest things God does in our life walks into our life on two legs, I also believe that some of the greatest pain we experience in life walks into our life on two legs. Our human relationships are the source of our greatest joys and our greatest sorrows. For this reason, I believe that if we are to do relationships well, that we need to develop a certain set of skills that are necessary to do relationships well. Among those skills are things like communication, love, patience, kindness, compassion, mercy, understanding. How about this one? Forgiveness. That if we are going to do relationships well, these are skills we need to develop to do relationships well. But I also believe that if we are to do relationships well, there is another less talked about skill that is equally as important. It's a skill that don't get a lot of mention, but it's a skill I believe God wants all his children to have, and that is the skill of discernment. <coughs> Discernment is a skill that the Lord wants all of his followers to have. It is a skill that we must have if we're going to do our human relationships well. If we're going to live in this life and interact with human beings well, we have to develop the skill and the sensory blessing of discernment. I believe that when God's people walk into a room, the Lord wants you to walk into a room and be able to have discernment when you walk into a room. The Lord wants you to be able to walk into different spaces and have discernment when you walk into those spaces. The Lord wants us to have discernment about our relationships. He wants you to have discernment about the people you're dating and courting. He wants you to have discernment about the person you think you want to marry. Let me use that word again. The person you think you want to marry. He wants you to have discernment about the things you need to desire and not desire. He wants you to have discernment about business meetings. Discernment about your job. Discernment about your family. Discernment about your children. He wants you to have discernment about your decision making. In fact, as we're making decisions, man, I think it is dangerous to make decisions and not have discernment. It is dangerous sometimes to enter into relationships with various people and not have discernment. The Lord Jesus absolutely wants his people to have discernment for the, the, the skill of discernment, the virtue of discernment, the sensory nature of discernment is humming in the background of this text. So let's give you a definition for discernment. It's going to come up on the screen behind me. Here is the definition for, of discernment. Discernment is one's ability to sense or decide between what is truth and what is error. What is real from what is false. What is right from what is wrong. It is one's ability to judge correctly. Watch this. Aided by the Holy Spirit, not your flesh. Some of you think you have discernment. You don't have discernment. You have condemnation. Tiana talked about it like, you don't have discernment. You condemn people and tag discernment to your condemnation. You judge people and attack discernment to your judgment. Discernment is one's ability to judge. What's the word? Aided by who? Not a it, a him. 
aided by the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, your helper, and to strengthen by the knowledge of God's word. Pause. That means the more sensitive you are to God's spirit, the greater you have discernment. The more knowledge you have of God's word, the greater discernment you will have. There are a lot of us who don't have discernment because we're biblically illiterate. And so we enter into spaces and relationships and can't make good judgment and decisions because we don't have the guidance of God's word in our heart to tell us don't make this decision based on some principle in God's word. So the more knowledge of the word that I have, the more discernment that I have. The more sensitive I am to the Holy Spirit, the more discernment that I have. Watch. So let's look back at last week's text very quickly. It's running in the background. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. Watch. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I want you to pause for just a second. I want you to look at the words where it says, judge not, right? In verse 1, it says, judge not. Now, in your English Bible, it says, judge not. There is a, a Greek word here, karino, uh, which it, a better translation of this word would not be judge not. It would be, don't judge, how can I put this? A better translation of the Greek word in this text would be, don't judge wrongly or judge rightly. Or when you enter into relationships with other people or you come into rooms of other people, have the ability to judge, to discern rightly, not wrongly. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean don't judge at all. No, you should judge, but you need to judge rightly and not judge wrongly. Do you understand that? How do you know that? Verse 2 is the answer to what I'm saying. It's the evidence of what I'm saying. That this is a bad English translation. He wants you to judge rightly. Deal with people rightly and not wrongly. What is the evidence of the Greek word you don't see here? Look at verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Pastor, I don't get it. Whatever you throw out is coming back to you. So if you don't judge right, if you don't deal with people right, if you deal with people wrong, you deal with people harshly, you judge people wrong, watch what the Lord is saying. He set up a principle in the earth that if you judge wrong, you condemn wrong, you deal with people wrong, whatever you put out is coming back to you. See, if you don't understand the boomerang nature of misjudging, you will keep doing it and feel like you have no consequence. So you would think it's okay to keep mistreating people and condemning people and wrongly judging people in your false piety and perverted religion, not realizing all that bad energy you put it out, you just wait, it's coming right back to you. Like you like to troll, it's coming right back to you. You want to judge wrongly, it's coming right back to you. So this is why the Lord is saying a better translation would be judge rightly because however you judge, however you discern, whatever you put out is going to come right back to you. And then Tiana taught this last week. Don't got to get into it. But verses 3 through 5 about, you know, that, that toothpick, that, that toothpick you keep trying to pull out of somebody's eye but you don't see the telephone pole sticking out your own eye. That whole thing right there is to teach you that before you can help other people is to teach you that before you need to discern what's going on in your life first. They missed that, Rhonda. Look, if you don't discern the issues in your own life first, you won't be able to properly discern the issues in somebody else's life. So if you're blinded by pride, you would try to help somebody with judgment and condemnation, but you won't be able to help them from the right heart. So you're putting out bad energy that's coming back to you. You're putting out bad vibes that's coming. You can pick your word. You're putting out bad stuff that's coming back to you. So the whole thing is you need to watch. Know how to discern what's going on in you first. The better you discern your own heart, the more effective you are in helping others. It's like when you're on an the airplane, they tell you put your own mask on first. Discern your oxygen level first before you try to put a mask on somebody else. And the Lord is telling you, I want you to discern as you're dealing with people. And the evidence of that is in verse 6. Look at verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs 
Don't throw it pearls before pigs, lest they trample underfoot and turn and attack you. Don't give the dogs what is holy. Now, I gotta, I gotta unpack this before I transition to our text. <coughs> this is not, dogs is not like, like, like chance and it's not these little pets we have in our home. Dogs were ravenous animals in the first century. And when Jesus says, don't give what is holy to dogs, everybody watch. He's, dogs is referring to people who blaspheme God, the truth of God, the kingdom of God. Watch this. People you be trying to help that don't want help. All right. Pay attention. Dogs refer to people you be trying to help that don't want help. Pastor, I don't get it. Jesus is saying you need to elevate the status of my truth and don't try to give it to people that don't want it, blaspheme it, reject it, tear it down. Don't waste your time trying to give truth to people that don't want to hear it. Don't try to keep help people that don't want to be helped. You counseling someone that hates Jesus, they're not ready to receive that truth. Watch. That's why you need discernment to be able to say, this heart is not ready for this truth. I got to come back to you in another season. I'm trying to talk to you and you don't like to listen. You know what? I'm just going to go quiet on you. I will not take the pearls of God's wisdom and let you trample it under your feet. Instead, I'm going to keep it to myself and I'm going to pray for you, you dog, that God would transform you, that he'd pull you out the kennel, you dog. That God would pull you out the kennel, you dog. That in another season, you become a kitten. And now your heart is palatable for God's truth. No, God's truth is too valuable to let some dog keep trampling it. So I'm not going to keep trying to force the pearls of God's righteousness down the mouth of a dog that don't honor it no way. So yes, we're called to spread the gospel. But no, we're not called to keep shoving God's precious truth down the mouths of people that don't want it. So what the Lord is saying, before you even, y'all always running around trying to preach people down, you need to discern whose hearts are open and whose hearts are closed. You trying to have an intimate conversation with somebody in the church about their behavior who don't want to listen. You dog. They're a dog that don't want to listen. They blaspheme God's truth. They got Christian in their profile and reject the word of God. You dog. You don't believe that? That's why when Jesus stood in front of Herod, a dog, he said what? Nothing. You don't believe that? That's why when Paul went up to certain people, he stood in front of certain and refused to argue with them about the word of God. That's why he said, don't argue about the word of God. If they don't want to listen, Jesus said, and in New York, we had this thing called Kim, my, my ninja. We'd be like, I almost, I got you, Elder Milton. I got you. He taught me I got to stop saying that word. We, in New York, we'd be like, yo, Kim, my ninja. That means keep it moving. They don't want to hear truth? Kim. Dishonor God's word? Kim. Kim, my ninja. Keep it moving. The Lord called his word a pearl and he said, stop giving it to pigs to trample. I.e., in all of your relationships, you need to start discerning who you're dealing with. Let me repeat this. I'm about to transition. In all of our relationships, everybody listening? How many relationships? How many? How many? You need to start discerning who you're dealing with. Not everybody in the church got your best interests at heart. You think because they're seated in a chair, they got your best interests at heart? No, you need to start discerning all of your relationships. Some of y'all dating and need to start discerning the person you're dating. You about to get married, you need to discern the person you're marrying. You hanging out with Christians, you need to discern who you're hanging out with. You're going to people's events. You need to discern what events you're going to. 
you listen to people's podcasts, you need to discern what you're listening to. You need to be careful because you keep lending your ears and your heart to people you have not discerned. That's why John said in the New Testament, you need to test every spirit by the person that helps you with discernment. You ain't impressing me because you can shout and lift a hand. Now I'm trying to discern. I'm, 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 I'm discerning. Ain't impressing me. Ain't nobody impressing me because you can sing or you could, you could usher or you could. No, no, no. We trying to discern. We looking for the usher's word hanging off the tree. I got plenty of people with talent I don't want nothing to do with. And there's a lot of you men, there's a lot of you men, you, you worship people on social media, but you don't want their life though. You're not discerning enough to see that what you don't want, you love their post, but you don't want their life. You don't want their marriage. I had some trolls creep up on my page this week. I got to get on my soapbox for just two minutes. Because I, I, I sampled like a voice of a rapper on a, on a post and I probably shouldn't have done that. Maybe it was a mistake, okay? I was just trying to use the words legacy. And I don't, I don't even listen to rap. I listen to books. I listen to the Bible. I listen to podcasts. I don't listen to music like that. So I, I sampled uh, these words legacy from a 444 Jay-Z album. And I probably shouldn't have done that. Maybe that was a mistake. And then you got all these trolls. Some troll came, some troll came up on my page like, look, you see, see? See, look, look, look. See, he sampled that voice. That means he listened to Jay all the time. See, now we know what you're all about. Now we know everything about you. This was it. Now, that means everything. We know everything about you now. And then some other troll chimed in with the first troll. See? See him? Yep. And now we know everything about him because of one sample. And in my mind, I'm thinking, troll, have you not checked the consistency of my life? Right. Where is your discernment? You just automatically assume because I sampled Jay-Z's voice that I'm, I'm some evil person and I'm an Illuminati. I'm doing all of this. Watch. Watch this. you throwing out wrong judgment. See, it, it, because you don't have discernment, so you pitch out wrong judgment. And I say to all them trolls, all that judgment coming right back to you since you're so self-righteous in your perverted piety. When me, if it was me and I'm looking at somebody else, I said, well, if, I, if, I, if I'm concerned for them, let me just pray for the brother. Let me check his track record to see. Watch. Let me judge rightly. There's a lot of you right now. I'm, look, look at me. You got a stack of trauma in your life, scars and pain from your human interactions because, we don't have, because we, we've done things without discernment. Are y'all listening? L listen to me. Let me repeat this before I transition. Everybody look right at me. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that you hate about your past from bad decisions that you make because you did things without discernment. You entered into relationships without discernment. We got married without discernment. We moved to places without discernment. We left places we was not. It's a lot of things we did that brought hurt to us now and if we look over our shoulder, we made decisions quick. We were emotional. We was whatever that you snotting and make, don't make decisions while you hyper emotional. We make decisions and, and you're going to continue to do this if you don't have discernment. A lot of us are living Christian lives with no discernment. You liking posts on social media with no discernment. You all over people's thumbs. With, I'm, I'm, you know, we, some of us are moving at 100 miles an hour. You starting businesses. You giving birth to ministries. God spoke to you on Monday. You giving birth to your ministry on Wednesday. You doing all this stuff with no discernment. <laughs> so I want you to ask me a question. Here's a question I want you to ask me. Pastor, if we need discernment for a better life, Jesus is telling us this, then I want you to ask me a question. Ask me a question. How what? How do you increase in discernment? Excellent question. Now watch the genius of Jesus. All a connected teaching. Chapter 7, verse 7. What's the first word? Ask. <laughs> the, 
These verses I'm about to unpack for you, you can use it in one of two ways. They are the most encouraging verses in the whole Sermon on the Mount, but in context, they are connected to discernment, but they're also connected to intimacy and getting your needs met. How do you increase in discernment? What's the first word? Yes. Shout it louder. Yes. Shout it louder. Yes. Ask and it will be given to you. Shout the next word. Seek and what? And you will find. Shout the next word. Knock and the door will be open. Watch the promise. Four, eight. For everyone who seeks, receives. And to one who seeks, he finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Go back to verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Let's unpack this text. Jesus tells you to do three things. Ask, seek, knock. Let's deal with them one at a time. First, the Lord says what? Ask. Ask is an invitation into the greatest thing you will ever have in this life. Intimacy with, with God Almighty. Verse 7 is this big word for you called access. It's what God has given you. Entry into my presence. Entry into my heart. Entry into my mind. I want you to ask. Watch. You don't have to keep trying to figure this out on your own. Why would you not talk to the one who is the author and the finish of your faith? Why would you not talk to the one who is omniscient, who knows all things? Why would you not talk to the one who has all power, all authority? And why would you not talk to the one that as you keep growing closer to him, man, you start growing in intimacy and discernment? So he says, watch, ask. Ask is an invitation into deeper prayer. Prayer is the most highest activity you ever do in your life. The more you pray, the more you ask, the more you keep petitioning God, the more intimate you grow with God. And look at me, all of us American Christians. The secret place is not a buffet for the flesh. The secret place is a sanctuary for the soul. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get the things that you want. The primary purpose of prayer is to draw nearer to God. The primary purpose for prayer is not a buffet for your flesh. It is a sanctuary for your soul. I feel safest in my prayer room. I feel strongest in my prayer room. I feel closest to God in my prayer room. I get help in my prayer room. I get comfort in my prayer room. I get peace in my prayer room. I get guidance in my prayer room. I get answers in my prayer room. I get discernment in my prayer room. I get yeses in my prayer room, noes in my prayer room, this in my prayer room. I hear God's voice in my prayer room. I get correction in my prayer room. I have catharsis in my prayer room. I release in my prayer room. I shed tears in my prayer room. I go into my prayer room weak and I come out strong. But why don't some of us ask? You know why? We don't ask because we're self-reliant. We think we don't need the Lord. And a lot of us are self-reliant, some of us because of pride. Our pride keeps us from prayer. Some of us are self-reliant because of ignorance. We just don't know better that if we would go to God, he would respond. Some of us are self-reliant because of indifference. We just don't care either way. And some of us are self-reliant because of fear. We're so afraid that God may not want to hear what we got to say, so we don't go in there and ask. But the Lord says, watch, you need discernment. You need everything else, fill in the blank. Ask. Now, he already taught you the prayer, the Lord's prayer. This is not, this is not, you know, now he's talking about prayer twice. He's talking about prayer behind the backside of judgment to teach you that you need discernment. If you want to have good human relations, you need to ask me for discernment so you know how to move amongst people. Seek. You will watch. Find. Now watch. If something could be found, that assumes I don't have it. You're not paying attention, Alexis. Not paying he said, seek and watch, and you will find. Yeah. If something could be found, that means right now I don't possess it. I don't get it, Philip. That means there's some things God wants to reveal to you, give to you, funnel to you that you don't yet possess because you're not seeking. Watch. 
Praying is easier than seeking. Seeking involves hunger. God has built into every human being. Watch this. God has built into every human being. Watch this. Curiosity. And I'm, listen to me. And your life will radically change when the apex of your curiosity terminates on God. That is when you use your curiosity to keep driving you to the Father, to keep seeking Him for everything He has for you. You know what it takes to do that? Hunger. And then He says, knock. He says, knock. Watch this. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of gully, so y'all might be different than me. I ain't never walk up on a door and knock once. I, I ain't never do that. Rhonda, we don't knock like that. We, you from Philly, Ellen Mills. We, we don't, how we knock? We go up and be like, hey, yo, what's good though? Open the door, I'm here. Never mind the doorbells right there. Hey, yo. And then when I go to some of my men's house, I'll be like, oh, oh, they know that's me. Oh, that's Phil. That's Odie. That's Dap. I'll be like, nobody knocks once on any door. I don't get it, preacher. The Lord said what? Knock. Keep pounding until you get a response. Knock until you get a response. Knocking is deeper than just asking because knocking goes past hunger. Knocking takes desperation, man. Man, I know women who were barren and was pounding, knocking for years, and now they got children because they kept knocking. I know people who were knocking for unsaved loved ones for years, and now those unsaved loved ones are saved because they kept knocking. Knocking means persist and don't give up. Keep hanging the doors of heaven. until something change, either until you change or the circumstance change or until they change. Some of y'all should be knocking for your husband. You're trying to change him by emasculating him. You should go and knock. You're trying to change her by controlling her. Knock. Now look at verse eight. For everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Now, everybody look at verse 8. Look at the screen. Watch. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. Let me read it to you again. It, you, it, it's going to hit you in your heart. Watch the second word. For everyone who asks receives, and for the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Pastor, I don't get it. <clears throat> Everybody could pray and pray and you could be carnal and pray and be an atheist and pray. Anybody can pray. And the Lord may respond, yes, no, wait, grace. That's easy. But the Lord changes the language from everyone to the one to single out those who have a little bit more hunger. How come, how come he been praying and he ain't got nothing? She been praying and God keep moving in her life. Well, he just praying. She praying, seeking and knocking. You, you can pray. I'm praying and I'm thirsty. I want all of God. I want all of Jesus. I want all of his presence. Man, I'm seeking. I'm going deep. I'm pursuing. I'm letting my curiosity terminate on Jesus. 
The thing I'm curious the most is how does God think? How does God work? How does God move? What does he have for me? What is he saying next? What is the next move for me? How do I need to make this change? How do I leave the church? The, the apex of my curiosity is terminating on God. What is your curiosity terminating on? How can I get more money? How can I be more famous? How can I build my Instagram? How can I build this? How can I do that's what, Your curiosity is terminating on all these things. Man, but if the apex of your curiosity switch, and the thing you want more than anything is the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, you know what starts ha happening? You've caught, you start finding stuff, which is revelation. <laughs> Watch. <laughs> and then things start opening to you because you've been knocking. <laughs> Pray, you get an answer. Seek, you start finding. Knocking, things start opening. All right, let's, let's, all right, let's finish the verse. Everybody watch. So the Lord wants to give you, watch this, confidence that you should knock, you should seek, you should ask, and that the effort is not on you. He's trying to show that it's not about so much your persistence, but it's about a loving father who hears. How do I know that? The evidence are the next four verses. Verse nine, everybody watch. Or oh, which one of you, No, I can't take my time. <laughs> or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, talking about you, why did he call you evil? Because you're sinful. Okay, I'm just bringing you back to that. Because you're sinful. I'm, oh, no, you're, you're not good. The scripture says no one is good. Amen. I'm a good person. No, you're sinful. Amen. And I'm sinful. The scripture says no one is good, not one. Really, the only person that is good is Jesus. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, now everybody watch, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things? You know why I like the word things? It's nuanced. It's open. It's fill in the blank. It's how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who what? Ask him. So what is he doing? He's trying to build your confidence. Watch. If y'all, now this is in the context of a loving relationship. If a loving father like Philip, Ryan, Kenny, Milton, Frank, if, if us loving fathers who are also full of sin, Kenny got sin, Ryan got sin, I got sin, Frank got sin, Elder Milton has sin. But let his daughter say, Daddy, I, I, need, I need some money because I got to buy this thing at school. His sinful nature is going to provide that for his daughter. If he, as a sinful man, would do that for his daughter, in his fallen nature, how much more with a perfect father respond to any of his children who keep asking, seeking, and knocking? You know what the Lord is doing? Trying to remove from your mind doubt that God won't move on your behalf. He's trying to remove from your mind any doubt that God would not move on your behalf. It may take some time, but God will move on your behalf. And let's finish. Last verse, verse 12. What's the first word? So. Now, so is a what? A transition word. It means if you considered everything else you heard before, I want you to do this. What did he say before? Don't judge wrongly. Ask, seek, and knock. Now, watch, watch how the master teacher lands. If you look at verse 7, it says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the measure you use will be measured unto you. And then he caps his teaching. This is one thought with verse 12 about judging people rightly about discernment, about asking, seeking, knocking. If you, look, 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 look. And the more you ask, seek, and knock, the closer you grow in intimacy with God, the more you grow in intimacy with God, the more you grow in discernment. The Lord wants you to have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with the Lord, and that happens through seeking, asking, knocking, and growing. Ask is an acronym, A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. Jesus made it simple for you. 
He's the first one to do alliteration. Ask. A-S-K. Ask, seek, knock. So you can't forget. Now watch how he finishes his thought about judging wrongly and judging rightly. Now everybody watch. He started by talking about what? Judging each other wrong. What did he start with? Judging each other wrong. What did he start with? Judging each other wrong. Now watch how he closes the thought. Verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So I don't get it. He says, whatever you want done to you, do that to others. I'm, I'm, I'm done, Frank. Listen, look right at me. No, this, don't mind, nobody move. This is important what I'm about to tell you. Look at me. How can I put this? He says, whatever you want to see come into your life, sow that into the lives of others. Watch, you, you want forgiveness to come into your life? Sow that into the life of others. Watch, you want, you want people to understand you? I'm a good person. You want to be understood? Sow understanding into the life of others. I want people to, you want people to respect you? Man, sow that into the life of others. Whatever you want to come into your life, sow that into the life of others. Now everybody watch, in his days, softly, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Hillel. He, was, he had influence and he was trying to tell people, Look, hate the things that are bad, hate the things that are wrong, just hate those things, and the rest is commentary for the law. Watch. In other religions, they teach you don't do what you don't want other people to do, and that's it. Listen, don't do is easy. To do takes more work. I don't get it. It's easy to say, I am not going to disrespect nobody because I don't want to be disrespected. As another thing says, I'm going to honor someone because I want to be honored. Not doing is easy, but can you do? It's not enough to just not do. I'm not going to curse them out because I don't want to be cursed out. That's not enough. But can you love them so that you will be loved? It's not enough to not do. He wants you to do. That is, the Lord wants you to be proactive, constantly sowing into the lives of others the things you want to see come into your own life. So it's not enough to say, well, I'm not going to say nothing about this, so that way I'm not going to be drama. Yeah, but you're not working to build either. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to disrespect my husband no more. Um, he pisses me off, but I ain't going to disrespect him. But you're not working to honor him either. Well, I ain't going to cause no trouble in my squad. You know, I'm just, I don't like them living here, but I ain't going to cause no trouble. But you're not working to bring about healing and reconciliation either. It's not enough to not do. He wants you to do. He wants his children to watch. Watch. Think about all the things you want for you. I want to be respected. I want to be loved. I want to be understood. I want to be liked. I want good friends. I want good relationships. When I do wrong, I want to be forgiven. When I do wrong, I want grace. All the things you want for you. He says, take all those things, watch, and intentionally sow them into the lives of others. Do unto others. What you want done for you. This is the law and the whole prophets. Meaning, if you obey that one commandment, you fulfill the underpinning of the whole Bible, which is to love people well. So we judge right by loving people well. And the more we keep seeking, asking, knocking, asking, seeking, knocking. We grow in intimacy with God. We grow in sensitivity of the heart. We grow in humility. The Lord can deal with us in those secret places in our heart. As we spend more time with God and we get more intimate with God and we learn more of the word of God, we grow in discernment. And as we grow in discernment, we know how to navigate our human relationships more effectively. Because discernment spreads, discernment spreads two things. Discernment first protects from spreading harm and being harmed. And discernment also promotes help and healing. That's the speck in the eye. The better I discern, man, this is what's really going on with Rhonda. Now I know how to help her. But if you're just judging her, you can't discern what's really going on. You can't properly help. 
The whole thing is wisdom. Don't judge wrong, discern right so you can help. This is good teaching. Judge right, let me change the word, discern right so you can help right. You keep thinking, I'm running this way because da 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 and she da 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 da. No, no, you judge it. Discern right so you can help right. And then sow into the lives of others what you want into yourself. Seek, ask, not keep pursuing me that you grow in intimacy with me. That the most important thing you would ever have in this life is a deep, intimate, personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Born of prayer, deep in prayer, anchored by prayer, in which he transforms the heart. He increases us in discernment. He helps us to love other people well. It transforms all of our relationships. If we get this right, our vertical begins to transform. And as our vertical transforms, us and God, our horizontal transforms, us and people. So don't try to figure this out on your own. And stop judging people wrongly. Ask. Seek. Knock. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And for the ones who knock, things will open for you. Let's pray. Nobody move. Except my prayer team. Nobody move. Eternal God and ever wise Father. I pray that you would take this word, this seed of your eternal word, and that you would plant it deeply and firmly in the hearts of my brothers and my sisters. For Lord, we will be dealing with human beings until you call us home. We don't want to keep having bad relationships. We don't want to keep offending one another. We don't want to keep drama going. We don't want to keep making bad decisions. God, we need discernment and we need to learn to love right and discern right and judge right. So Father, I pray right now you would rob us of condemnation towards others, of false judgment towards others. You would rob us of blindness and that you would help us to have a, how can I say love? Give us, Lord, an unquenchable desire for your presence that keep drives us to our knees, that we will want to love the secret place. And there we will keep asking, keep seeking and knocking and growing in a deep, intimate, personal relationship with you that is life-giving and life-transforming and life-healing. And there, God, deal with our hearts. Increase us in discernment that we may move and navigate our human relationships with a sense of responsibility, humility, and wisdom. I pray that over my brothers and my sisters right now. We need this to change because we will not stop dealing with people until you call us home. I'm asking God to do something now in the hearts of your people. Give somebody the grace, God, Lord, to sow into the lives of others what they want in their own lives. We must see change in this area. You do it, Lord. Hold one key, Frank. And come up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Hold one key, Frank. Hold, hold, hold still right there. My brother and my sister. The most important thing you need to discern is that you're religious and you're far away from God. You need to discern like I did in 2003 over a bathroom and a toilet seat. I see tears falling. That you are actually far away from God. You are not a Christian. Or maybe you call yourself a Christian, but you're not a disciple. If you died in a car accident on the way home, you're going to be separated from God for all your life because you do church, but you have not done relationship. And you already know who you are. You're sitting in the room right now. You've done church. You've done religion. And for some of you, you've done nothing. And the thing you need to discern is that you're actually disconnected from God. You do not have a personal relationship with him. You know why? Because you are a sinner and so am I. And your sin has separated you from God. 
And the scripture says if anyone dies in their sin, you're going to be eternally separated from God. You're going to end up in a place where you're never going to get out and you're not prepared to go there. But here is the love of the Father. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus, into this earth, lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death in your place, and said if anyone will put their trust in him, repent, turn from sin, he shall make you a son and daughter. He'll forgive you of all your sin. A fancy prayer can't do that. My sermon can't do that. It's the sovereign work of God is happening right now in your seat. I just want to know who I'm praying for. I'm talking to you. You want to be forgiven of all your sin. You want to be a brand new woman, a man. You want to walk out of here knowing that you're headed to heaven. God is already working in your heart. He's been doing it before the foundation of the world. We just want to celebrate what God is doing because my prayer can't do it, but the Holy Spirit has done it already. He's the one regenerating you. If I'm praying for you, I want to know who I'm talking to. I'm going to count to three. I want you, I see them hands already. I want you to lift your hands on the count of three if I'm talking to you and God is working on your heart. You want to turn from your sin. You want to be forgiven. You want to be a brand new man and woman. You're watching me online on the count of three. One, Jesus is calling you. Two, you already belong to him. Three, throw your hand in the air. Leave it there. Throw it up high. Leave it there. Throw it up high. Leave it there. I see that hand. One, two, three. I see that hand. Four, five, six. I see that hand. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I see that hand. 14, 15, 16. I see that hand. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I see that hand. 22. My sister, I see that hand. 23, 24. I see that hand. My sister, 25. I see that hand in the back. My brother, 26, 27, 28. I see that hand. 28. Oh, 29. I see that hand. Oh, 30. I see that hand. <coughs> oh, 31. I see that hand. 32. I see that hand. It's the Lord. It's not me. 33, I see that hand in the back. It's the Lord, not me. 33. 34, I see you, my brother. God is working in your heart. It's the Lord, not me. 34. 34. 34. 34. Oh, 35, I see you. 35, God is working in your heart. It's the Lord, not me. 35. You 35 men and women, we're going to just just right there in your seat. Would y'all just start praising God softly? Just praise it so they can speak to God. Just just worship God, y'all. The room, just, just sturdy atmosphere with faith. Like, it's the front line of battle. We, we snatching souls from hell. It's the front line of battle. You 35 people, while we're praising, just tell Jesus you're sorry. Ask him for forgiveness of your sin. Tell him you surrender. Tell him you put your trust in him. Just yield right now. Yield while we worship him for your soul. Just yield. Come on, worship, brothers and sisters. Worship. Fill the room with that. With, fill the room with faith. Come on. Fill the room with faith. Come on. Fill the room with faith. Come on. Hallelujah. And now, Father, I pray over these 35 men and women. Not a special prayer, not magic, not pixie dust. Your Holy Spirit regenerating them. They belong to you from the foundation of the world. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in them, filling them with your spirit. You snatched them from hell. You made heaven their new home. You delivered them from the kingdom of darkness and brought them into the kingdom of light. You gave them a new name, forgiven. You've given them a new name, saved. You've given them a new name, son and daughter. I pray, God, that they will have an explosive prayer life, that you would draw them to yourself, that they will sense and feel the guidance of your Holy Spirit, and that today will be the beginning of the rest of their lives. Now, Lord, you said when one sinner repents, oh my God, all of heaven rejoices. So right now we rejoice.